Chapter 3, Ricky Molina. Evan and I dig like crazy, clearing the mud and weeds away from the hard surface underneath. Jason leans over and brays, What is it? directly into my ear. That guy has no volume control. Everything comes out at 11. I knock on it with my fist. Well, it's definitely metal. It feels like a big square plate. The runoff from the storm must have uncovered it. Big deal, yawned CJ, the one with the messed up face. Somebody threw away a piece of metal. whoop de doo I keep on digging. I'm not sure why I'm being so stubborn. Maybe it's this. Evan and his buddies have made it pretty clear that I'm about as welcome in this group as a bad stomach flu. And if this metal plate turns out to be something interesting, or even valuable, then these guys won't be able to make me feel so useless. Okay, so it's probably just junk. But what if it isn't? What if it's the top of a metal box that has something cool inside? Like a time capsule or secret grave? Or for all we know, it could be a million dollars cash from some long-forgotten bank heist. Evan is working as hard as I am, and so is that Mitchell kid, although he's digging from a distance with a long branch. What's this? Evan asks. There's a slot in the metal near the edge of the plate. And all at once it comes to me, like one of those optical puzzles where you have to see the hidden image. The slot, it, it's a handle. I stand up, I fix the fingers of both hands into it, and I heave with all my might. For the first couple seconds, it won't budge. And then, with a crunching sound, the earth and the stones around the edges break away, and the trap door rises up on its rusty hinges with a creaking sound. No way! Jason booms. The five of us gather around, gawking down into the hole. There's something there. An underground chamber. A metal ladder bolted to the wall descends into the darkness. I pull out my phone and turn on the flashlight app. The ladder stretches about 12 feet straight down to a metal floor. And is that a welcome mat? Evan breathes, squinting down into the gloom. Someone lives here? Jason asks in amazement. I don't think so, I answer. Well, at least not anymore. I'm pretty sure that trap door was covered by dirt before the hurricane washed it away. Only one way to figure out. Find out. I swing a leg over the side and I step down to the first rung. Maybe this isn't such a great idea, Mitchell says nervously. I mean, there could be wild animals living down there. With a welcome mat, CJ challenges. I'm going to. Evan decides, if anything eats Ricky, then I'm better off facing it than trying to explain to my grandma that I lost him. I step carefully at first, but the ladder seems sturdy. Holding my phone light in my teeth, I clamber down until I'm standing on the welcome mat. Evan scrambles after me, and we stand opposite each other, frozen in time, and I'm a little bit scared. Hello? I sound like a first grader. Hey, anybody get eaten yet? Mitchell calls from above. His voice seems distant. I brandish my phone so that I can light our way, and before I can look around, Evan yanks down a heavy metal toggle switch on the wall. There's a loud click, and the whole place lights up like it's high noon. I close my eyes from its sudden brightness, and when I open them again, I'm in another world. There's a whole house down here, or at least a whole apartment. It must be almost 30 feet long, clad in metal, lit by bulbs in the ceiling. There's a full kitchen, complete with a sink and running water, and in a small alcove behind it, a chemical toilet. There's a living area with a futon couch and even one of those bulky old-fashioned TV sets with a squarish screen rounded at the corners. The floor is decorated with a rug, a little dusty but fancy, probably expensive, Persian or Chinese. I mean, not that I'm an expert, but some of the families from my old school owned a lot of pricey high-end stuff, and it's not hard to recognize that kind of thing once you've seen it a few times. Are you guys okay? We hear CJ's voice call from the surface. Where's all that bright light coming from? Come on down, Evan invites him. You're not going to believe it. Jason climbs down and stands, blinking and staring. Whoa, what is this place? He hollers, and the echo reverberates off the metal walls. That guy's loud enough in the regular world, and down here he's a human bullhorn. 
CJ's next, followed eventually by a reluctant Mitchell who looks like he's expecting at least a Bengal tiger to leap out of the chemical toilet and swallow us whole. Okay, I don't get it, CJ admits. If nobody lives in this place, then why is it here? Who builds an underground house in the middle of the woods? Who builds any kind of house if they're not going to live in it? This is bigger than my dad's apartment, Jason puts in. He opens a kitchen cabinet to reveal a stack of elegant china plates and a row of crystal glasses. Nicer, too, except for that TV. That's a piece of junk. Now, I'm forming an opinion about that. I don't think it's junk. I, I think it's just old. Like, all TVs were like that before flat screens were invented. You see that machine on the shelf underneath it? That's a player for video cassettes like they used to have in the 70s and 80s. Yeah, my grandparents have one, Evan confirms. It's in a box in the basement, but Grandpa won't throw it out. I guess it cost a lot when he bought it. Well, don't you get it? I persist. Expensive plates, expensive glasses, expensive rugs, expensive stuff from a long time ago. This place used to belong to some rich guy, someone who could afford to have it built and hooked up to electricity and filled it with all the comforts of home. And the reason it's abandoned is... He's probably dead. Mitchell shudders. I don't want to be in some dead guy's house. It could be haunted. Not unless he died in it, CJ points out. Do you see any old bones around here? Evan is kneeling in front of the TV. I wonder if this thing works. Where's the remote? There isn't one. Everything was buttons back then. I join him and try to push the, push the on button, which turns out to be a switch that you have to twist. There's a click, and the screen brightens a little, but there's nothing on it. Huh, that figures, Mitchell puts in. It's broken. I turn the channel dial, clicking past 1 through 12, and there's nothing. That's when I notice the light on the video cassette player. There's a tape in there, I exclaim, and I hit play. Finally, we get something on the screen. First, a procession of upside-down numbers, followed by a weird line of distortion that starts at the bottom of the screen and slowly climbs all the way to the top. This is a really boring show, CJ announces with a smirk that makes the injured side of his face look grotesque. And suddenly we see a guy, Jason bellows, rattling the metal walls. The man on the screen is probably in his 60s with white hair and steel-rimmed glasses. He wears a fancy three-piece suit and sits at a carved desk in what looks like a posh office with lots of dark woods, red leathers, and gleaming glassed-in bookcases. Ha, there's our rich dude, Evan supplies. He starts to speak, but there isn't any sound. I scramble to twist the volume knob and a commanding voice emerges from the small speaker. This is a person who's used to being in charge. So if you're watching this, I have to conclude that I'm dead and America is under attack. I won't apologize for the fact that I can't speak Russian or Chinese or the language of whoever is in charge here. I'm sure your translators will figure it out soon enough. Who is that old guy? Jason asks in confusion. That guy looks kind of familiar. CJ snaps his fingers. You know what? That's Bennett Delamere. The name means nothing to me. Who's Bennett Delamere? Evan provides the answer. He's the founder of Delacraft Auto Parts. Half the town works there, or at least they did until the layoffs started. Including my mom, Mitchell adds mournfully. Is he dead? I ask. I'm pretty sure he died a long time ago, Evan replies, but I don't think that's what he's talking about here. I mean, what's all this stuff about America being under attack and speaking Russian and Chinese? Now the facts are starting to come together in my head. A mysterious underground hideaway, bizarre talk about an invasion and speaking Russian and Chinese, an old fashioned video cassette playing on technology from the 70s or 80s. I know what this place is, I blurt. It, it's a bomb shelter from the Cold War. What's a Cold War, Mitchell asks. I mean, besides when my mom turns down the thermostat to save money on her heating bill. I remember that from social studies, CJ interjects. The Cold War was that time when the Americans, the Russians, and the Chinese were all afraid we were going to nuke each other. 
Right, I agree. And a lot of people built underground bunkers like this one so that they could survive a nuclear war. I pointed to the screen where Bennett Delamere was threatening the invaders that America will rise again. That would explain his weird message. It makes sense, you know, Evan muses thoughtfully. I mean, everyone said that Bennett Delamere was kind of eccentric, and a rich guy like him would have plenty of money to carve out a place like this in the middle of the woods and deck it out like a vacation house. I step over to the kitchen and begin opening cabinets and drawers. The largest unit turns out to be a pantry that is jammed full of canned food, stacked floor to ceiling. There are soups and stews, beans and vegetables, whole meals and tins and in fries, freeze-dried packages. See, I announce, this is enough food for somebody to shelter for months. People who live in underground bunkers shouldn't eat beans, CJ comments in that deadpan voice of his. It's the musical fruit, you know. I sniff the air. Well, it's actually pretty fresh in here. There's got to be some kind of circulation fan somewhere. This Delamere guy might have been a kind of a wing nut, but he sure knew how to build a bomb shelter. He was a jerk, Mitchell says bitterly. According to my mom, Canaan used to be the best town in the state until Della Craft Auto Parts started laying people off. On the TV, Bennett Delamere finishes off, finishes off with, You may have killed me, but there are plenty more red-blooded Americans to pick up the torch of freedom and drive you from our shores. God bless America. The screen goes dark and there's a whirring sound for a few seconds before the video begins all over again. Upside down numbers first. Bennett leans over and hits pause before the tape can restart. The image of Bennett Delamere freezes, his index finger still at full wag, his mouth open in mid-word. What a chump, CJ comments. He spent all this money to protect himself against a bomb that never fell and a war that never came. Money doesn't care who owns it, Jason agrees. I'd give anything to have a place like this. Actually, I say slowly, you, you do have a place like this. This place. Get a grip, Ricky, Jason sneers, like Bennett Delamere would give it to us. Bennett Delamere is dead, I remind them. He doesn't need it anymore, and nobody else knows about it. At least I doubt it. If it wasn't for the hurricane, that trap door would have stayed buried forever. Guys, 20 minutes ago, you were all moaning and groaning because the storm blew away that collection of shower curtains and keep-out signs that you call a fort. Don't you see that we just found the greatest ready-made fort in the history of the world? They stand there staring at me like I'm speaking Norwegian. Mitchell is the first to find his voice. I know what you're up to. You're ticked off because you weren't part of the old fort, so now you're trying to weasel in on the new one. Mitchell, CJ chides, gent chides gently, he's got a right to be part of this fort. He found it, remember? Okay, Evan is all business. If this is going to then be our fort, we have to lay down a few ground rules. Underground rules, Mitchell amends. Rule number one, total secrecy. Nobody except the five of us is allowed to know about this place. And if any parents get wind of it, they're going to start asking questions about whether or not it's safe. And before you know it, they're going to shut us down. And no other kids either, because they might tell their parents. Jason speaks up. But obviously I have to tell Janelle. An angry babble from the others shouts him down. Janelle's the last person you can tell, Evan informs him sternly. Her dad's a cop, and we can't let the authorities find out about this place. We don't own it, you know. Yeah, but did Bennett Delamere's dead, Jason argues, and I remember hearing that he never got married or had any kids. Still, I reason, there's got to be like a nephew or a cousin who inherited his millions. That would be the owner of this place, even if that person doesn't know it. Well, let's keep it that way, Evan adds, by making sure Janelle never has a chance to mention it to dear old dad. Jason doesn't look happy. Janelle says that honesty is the most important thing in a relationship. You won't be lying, I assure him. You're just going to leave a couple details out. Besides, Mitchell says, this old fort was, the old fort was guys only, so that rule automatically transfers here. What rule? 
Jason complains, his booming voice resonating. That old fort only existed for like six hours before the hurricane wrecked it. We never even got to hang out there. CJ puts his hands over his ears. Dude, if we're going to be spending a lot of time down here, no yelling is going to have to be rule two. Jason glares at him. How come all the rules have to be about me, huh? Why don't we have a rule about not scraping half your face off? Or no, what's that thing about the 13s? Tris, tr, triska, triskaidekaphobia, I reply. Or no bringing some stranger along and blaming it on your grandmother. He presses on with a scowl at Evan. How about some rules like that? I take a breath and I survey the four of them. Okay, I'm the new guy and you've been friends forever. I get that, but think about how lucky we are. We got a great place that we can come to whenever we want. Chances are the one other guy who knew about it died a long time ago, so it's 100% ours. What are the odds that we just stumble on it like we did? But it's not going to do any good if we can't stop fighting about it. Evan nods. Ricky's right. There's a long pause as the others try to dream up a reason why I'm wrong. I must be wrong because I'm the outsider. Of all the towns for my fo folks to have to move to, why Canaan, huh? It's always hard to be new, especially when you're the youngest, but why are these guys so dead set on being jerks? If one of them had found the trapdoor, they'd shut me out in a heartbeat. Even Evan. Okay, he's defending me now, but... This morning, he made it pretty clear that he'd rather stuff me down a sewer than bring me along to hang out with his friends. Eventually, though, they all nod, even Mitchell. Evan finds a pad of paper and a stubby pencil in a kitchen drawer and writes, We, the undersigned, promise to keep our fort a secret until the very last one of us is as dead as Bennett Delamere. And we all sign our names in a circle. That way we're all equal, I explain, because nobody comes first. And then we shut off the power and we climb the ladder to the surface. With all the storm damage, it's an easy job to find enough fallen branches to cover the trapdoor. The fort had lain hidden for over 40 years. It would be a shame to have someone else discover it right after we've claimed it as our own. It's as we're retracing our steps out of the woods that the text comes to my phone. My window has been fixed and the branch is officially out of my bedroom. I can go home at any time. Awesome, Evan exclaims far too enthusiastically when I give him the news. It's pretty plain that he can't get rid of me soon enough. Funny, I should be twice as happy as Evan. The last thing I need to do is hang around where I'm not wanted. But everything has changed somehow. I started the day as the unwelcome new kid from a magnet school. But now... I'm the 20% owner of a fort.